You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from my weekly special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and anywhere else you will get your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as on a personal note, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching one-on-one and group coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or as you can see in the background, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. I will put those social media links and notes in the show notes. So let me get on with the show and introduce always a favorite part of my show is my guest and clearly no exception this week, very close friend of mine. Let me tell you a little bit about Walt Miller. Walt was raised in California by his father, who was in sales, and his mother, who was a people person. He came, so sales came quite naturally to him. When he was 19, he started working for a company named Snap-on Tools, the leader in automotive tools. Shortly thereafter, he saw the opportunity to purchase his own franchise, and two years later, Snap-on offered him a management position. He recruited, taught, and managed eight franchisees. Walt then stepped away from Snap-on that career and bought another franchise called CUDA, which was the leader in automotive parts washers. And then it says, of course, he then came back to what he loved the most, which was selling Snap-on tools. And he has been a Snap-on franchisee ever since. And I know in getting to know him very well, it was more like about 25 or 30 years total. But first and most importantly, Walt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Looking, Looking forward to it. You bet. You bet. So... For any of the typical visitors or viewers or listeners to the podcast, they may know I always start with the same first question and end with the same last question. So my first question, to give context to the the listeners and viewers, is how did you and I meet? (laughs) Well, it was really interesting. It was, um, I believe, 1996, I believe, 96 or 97. And uh, I was was on the route, and I either got a phone call or an email from Snap-on. And they said, hey, uh, there's a gentleman that owns a detail shop, and he's got a battery charger that, that needs some attention. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, great. Yeah, detail shops, they don't buy tools, you know, I'm thinking. <laughs> but I looked at where it was at, and it was right next to a shop that I already serviced. So I thought, well, I'll poke in there and see what's going on. So, so of course, I had the next uh, opportunity I had, I poked in there, and I go to the front counter. And uh, I think a gentleman named Rob comes, comes to the counter, and I say, mm-hmm. is David, David Brooke here? He says, yeah, he's up there in his office. And I said, well, I'm going to snap on. So I, I, he had a, he's got a request for service. So, oh, okay, he wants to I'll guide you up. So I go up, up, up the stairs and into this office. It's got a, it's got a short, short little ceiling that I've got to, got to duck under. I said, hey, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm Walt Miller with Snap on. He goes, oh, hey, how you doing? And what, what our conversation was, I really don't remember, but I know one thing that we talked about everything for about 15 minutes other than why I was there. We talked about life, talked about people, just talked about everything. And, and I think we sure we we shortly realized that you know you and I could be buds, right? Just we just we just clicked, and then we of course got to the business at hand, which was the part of the uh, battery charger. But yeah, that was that was the, how I recollected. Is that pretty close? You think? Yeah, well, I think so, and I, I really remember that short ceiling because there was a <laughs> there was a space. Maybe they're supposed to put storage. But I put a desk in there, and then the ceiling yeah. was like right about here when I'm sitting down. Yeah, right, this is right. kind of weird, but it was neat to have yeah. a place up top and things. But you no, know, you bring up a really great point because I think about. A uh, couple of buds of mine, too, where we've said probably similarly after getting to know each other, we should be friends. And I've always been fascinated by how fast you make that connection. You meet somebody, yeah. Walt, Dave, Dave, Walt. And it just seems like in a few cases, uh, there's ones like, man, we got to let's have some coffee. We got to continue yeah. this conversation. And others, 
a three minute conversation is about two and a half minutes too long, you know, and it's just kind of this. But did you notice that with all this experience at Snap on before we go back and start where you kind of started? But did you kind of notice the same that same effect with all these different clients that you got over the years when you first met them that have the same kind of impact? Yeah, there's I've always said there's probably about a dozen. I don't, I don't know if it's more than a dozen, but a, a dozen relationships I have even today that I met back in the 80s. And just you just knew these were good people. They had great character. Um, again, being raised by, uh, by my parents that were, as you mentioned, my dad was in sales. My mom was just everyone loved my mother. She was a people people her people person. And so being raised with those types of people, you, you learn to understand, um, I guess, people's integrity, their character fairly quickly. And so obviously laying the groundwork for that was me going into sales and, and, and the business I'm in for the, for the viewers, the franchise that I own, I see each customer every week. So on Monday morning, my first stop is a, is a shop called Waste Management. I see them every Monday at my first stop. So obviously seeing your customers every, every week, you get to know them fairly well. Now, granted, it's it's really kind of a small window of, of talking what I call you know about life because we get right to business, but you learn early on who you want to continue rather than just the business relationship with, because you get to know about their parents, you get to know about their upbringing, you get to be, know about who they are, mm -hmm. and so like you and I did in 1996, you know, you either know if you click with somebody or you don't. Right. And and again, for my business, uh, it's that's not a criteria because I'm in sales. I'm there to sell them tools. Right. I don't really care what their personal life is really typically is, but, uh, but that's, yeah, that's, I, again, I, I kind of came by naturally. And again, being in the business so many years now, I, I'm pretty good at judge of character. So. Yeah. And that's, and as I think, as I was writing down 1996, that's, I think that's 26 years to 2022. <laughs> so it's, it's, I was, I would have said, I don't know. I know about 10 years or so. And it's like Blue by. 26 yeah. years, but, yeah. but so let's back up a little bit. When I talk about to the listeners and viewers of the podcasts, you're hopefully going to have some takeaways and some tips and whether it's life or business or families or whatever it might be. But I also think the context of how somebody was raised is very important. I was fortunate enough to know your mother. I uh, wasn't around to know your father, but talk a little bit about how you were raised with a couple of sisters and just different things that, that maybe the listeners would be interested in and how that shaped you as far as both of your mom, but how you were brought up and some of the reasons you're very, very disciplined. I know you very well and maybe where some of that came from. Yeah, it's, I was raised in a divorce uh, atmosphere. Of course, my mom and, and dad divorced when I was very young and four or five years of age in, in that range. And, um, and so back then uh, there wasn't quite the, the, the 50, 50 custody like they have nowadays The their mother was really given the, um, the sole, sole um, job of raising the kids and the, and the father was kind of a weekend visitor. <clears throat> and that's kind of how it was set up with me. Uh, my, my sisters really didn't see my dad as much as I did, but um, you know, my mom was living in an apartment uh, with the three of us. It was very tough times. A lot of times we were raised very, very poor. And on the weekends, I'd see my father about every other weekend. And so um, I would say that the one thing that I, I, I really learned the, the most about um, being raised in such a tough time is to appreciate what you have. Mm. And that's, I know that's your message to be grateful for, for what you have. And I, I tell you what, but I, to this day, um, I, I reflect back on a lot of those times because uh, again, I, I never really got new pants. I didn't get new clothes for school. Didn't get very much of new of anything, but you know what? We had love and we had, uh, we had our togetherness. Mm -hmm. And so then of course to flip, to go, when I went to see my dad, my dad did very well financially. So he was kind of like the, you know, I would go over there. It was kind of like Christmas every other weekend. You know, he, he bought me things and, and, uh, and didn't, wasn't really um, struggling for anything. He had nice cars, nice homes. So I saw, uh, it was a paradigm shift for both going from one place to the other. Um, as far as my discipline, I really got it from both. Um, both parents raised me that there's a consequence, um, either positive or negative or whatever you do. And um, again, I, I learned early on, I wanted those positive consequences rather than the negative ones. Uh, I was spanked. I know that you don't, these, these parents don't do that nowadays and, and they didn't have to do it a lot, but I, I got spanked a couple of times and that I didn't like that. So those are some of the negative consequences. But, um, but as far as, far as the, your, your question, the discipline, um, again, my dad being a salesperson, he, you know, when he says he had to, he was going to do something for either his customer or his friends or family, he did it. Mm -hmm. My mother was the same way. My mother and father are both very punctual, never late. 
Um, if they said to be there at 12, they were there at 1145. That's just the way they function. That's the way I, I live my life. And so um, I think growing up in that kind of atmosphere um, and, and my sisters, you know, I didn't get any, uh, any exceptional treatment because I was a boy. I still had to do dishes. I still had to do laundry. I still had to do all this through vacuuming. So it was, it was, it was, I think I look back, it was a good upbringing for me to mold me who I am today, work ethic I have today and the people and the person I am today and how I treat people. So. And I think that I'm just making some notes because I'm always pulling out the little takeaways, the little bullet points that, that lessons that can be learned to pass on to those that are maybe a few years younger than you or me. Uh, you always, always mentioned, always in the same sentence, uh, your mom, people person. What was it about Gloria that made her such a people person? And some of these be on time and actions have consequences of things are just great things as part of the discipline. But every time I ever saw her, she always had a smile on her face and just was very warm. Where do you think that came from? Or how did she kind of help? How did that help shape you? Well, she got it directly from her mother. Her mother passed, my grandmother passed at a young age. She was, I believe, in her mid 60s, not very old at all. She had cancer. Um, but she was exactly like her mother. Just everyone loved my Nana, just wonderful woman. Uh, my mom, uh, she's just like you said, you, you, um, you, you hit it right on the head. She always smiled. Even when she wasn't feeling well, she smiled. And she, she did what, uh, what we all should do more often. Is she used these twice as much as this. Mm -hmm. And so when she would talk to somebody, she would listen very, very carefully about what that person saying. And she could find out fairly quickly if that person is struggling or if that person is sad or if that person's happy and, and, and all the emotions, she, she could just nail it. And as I was growing up, I, I always got very curious on how she was able to do that. And she said, um, she said, Walter, do you, do you think I talk a lot? She asked me this one day. I said, well, yeah, I, th I think you do mom. And she says, well, she says, a lot of people think that, but I listen twice as much as I talk. Mm -hmm. And she said, let me give you an example. She gave me a couple examples and it made a lot of sense to me. And so with that, um, with that upbringing, and, and of course, my dad being more of a polished, I use the best word, salesman, very, very good at, uh, at listening to what the customer wants and all that. Again, I, I didn't realize what I was going to do. I just knew that that was something I like people. And so, um, yeah, she, she just, uh, again, I miss her every day. She, um, she couldn't let uh, um, anybody go without just putting her stamp on, on, on the relationship. Mm -hmm. So she had so many friends. So that's, hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And then I, I want to make sure I give fair airtime to your dad. Uh, every time I've ever asked you about that, it's always about uh, successful and polished and, and so on and so forth. What, what were the keys to his success as far as I know, ultimately, he certainly died younger than uh, you would like to have a, a father uh, die, but uh, same with your mom too. But what, what, what was it about him that made him so good and so polished, if you will? Well, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a guess on that because him dying at 45 years old, and I was very, I was in my early 20s when he passed. Um, you know, you learn a lot about your parents as you get older, I think, because you shift into a different dynamic of relationship. You're no longer father son. You're now hopefully father son friend, so to speak. Right. But we we really never molded into that as much as 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 I would have liked to before he passed. So I'm just going to take a guess on it. But what I believe what it was, he was he was the only child, and um, he was the the third the third Walter. So of course, me being the fourth, and he was uh, raised very disciplined. It was a very disciplined household. My, my, my grandfather and grandmother, uh, they were strict, very strict. And so he, um, he went into the service at 18, Air Force, and he just, he loved it. He would have probably stayed in, uh, I'm drawing a blank on what happened, but his, uh, on his fourth year, he ended up getting out for some reason. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it was, but he would have probably stayed in. He loved the structure. He loved the discipline and all that. Just mm -hmm. loved it. And so with that, going into, you know, having kids, um, he... He kind of raised this the same way with, with the discipline uh, and with the structure. I mean, my dad had notes all over the house about him doing certain things. He always had a plan. He always had to, he was just, you know, his, his clothes were always just perfect. He never looked shabby. I mean, he was always shaved. I mean, he's, he was just a very, very, um, again, disciplined with himself. And so I, I think that comes from his upbringing. Yeah. And, um, and also too, I think, you know, there's a, no one's going to, no one's going to tell David Brooke or Walt Miller how to, to present themselves every day. We have to get up, we got to shower, we have to brush our teeth. It's all up to us. And he right. took pride, he took pride in his, in his look. He's a very, very handsome guy, um, very, took care of his body and, and, and all that. 
but I think that, you know, at the end of the day, we all, we have to be disciplined enough to want to do that. Yeah. And he did. And he was just that disciplined. So. And even at 45, uh, passing on, uh, I can't recall, did he have several careers or is he kind of more in one arena most of his life? Yeah, he was in sales. Uh, back then, um, you really, um, he worked for a, a warehouse shelving company. And I think the mm. company, believe it or not, I can't believe I remember this, Green Penny, I believe it was in Oakland. Wow. And he was with them for the longest time. And, and uh, he would go, I, I'm not sure how he developed leads. Again, we never got into that part of our relationship, but he, uh, he did very well for himself. And uh, he would go to companies and develop the, these, uh, these steel shelving uh, systems for their warehouses. And um, that's, that's what he did for the majority. And then I believe that company closed and he went to work for uh, another company, maybe three to four, maybe five years before he passed. And um, yeah, but the, he was, he was, again, uh, always wore a suit every day, um, had appointments every day and uh, you know, Monday through Friday type of thing. So. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a nice segue as hard as he worked and as the, the person your mom was, it got that from her mom. And so often, although I do think it's interesting, sometimes I think it skips a generation. I'm a very positive person. My dad was maybe the most negative guy I ever met. So yeah. sometimes you look at your parents and you think, I want to be just like them when I grow up or just not like them when I grow right. up. And I still remember, I don't know, 12, 15 years old, somewhere in there, something happened to my mom or dad, or they were angry or jealous or being petty or something. I thought, man, when you first realize your parents are human. <laughs> you know, and you think they're they're beyond human because they brought yeah. you into this world. I, yeah. I still tell people and they look at me and kind of laugh. I, I'm just telling you the truth. I was yeah. about 10 or 11. I thought, how will I ever live without my parents? Yeah. I mean, who will who will get a bedroom for me in a house? Who will feed me food? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. So, but I want it. I, I think that when I talk about business owner, Walt Miller, and I just am so impressed with what you've done, as you know, we've talked about this many times, but kind of talk a little bit about the, the journey. It's in the bio, but the journey that got you to where you are today in terms of the steps, especially with Snap-on, but anything that kind of led up to that, that might've prepared you to, to really be this franchise owner, as you said, and how and why that made you so successful, because you've been amazingly successful in a business that from what you've told me, just because you get a truck and a bunch of tools doesn't mean somebody's automatically successful. Right. Well, I was, uh, I was very fortunate at a young age. I, I actually started with Snap-on uh, in 1981 in the warehouse. There was a position available. In fact, I think uh, it was a, my sister's friend who worked at an agency and we were, we were at a family gathering, I believe. And, and she says, what are you doing for work? I said, well, actually, I'm looking for work as we speak. And she said, well, there's a, there's a job opportunity at Snap-on. And I said, oh, so I, I believe that's how it unfolded. And so I, I went ahead and did the interview and got, got the job. And so I, I was working in the warehouse for, for a couple of years. And um, there was uh, three, three people I met who, who to this day I consider my mentors. Bob Halford, he was, a, he was the branch manager of, the, of that warehouse. And, and Gary DeVore was the sales manager. I met those two first. And um, my boss was Bob. And, and Bob, of course, introduced me to, the, to, the, to, to Gary and Bob. And I instantly was just impressed with how they treated me. Here, I'm just a warehouse guy. This is a branch manager and a sales manager of, of, this, of this branch. And they're treating me just like one of their own. You know, uh, didn't, didn't treat me as a young kid. Didn't, didn't talk down to me. And just, I, I, was, I was really appreciative of that. And so obviously getting, getting a couple of years under my belt, they got to know, know me. I got to know them. They understood my character. They understood, you know, if, if I ever called in sick, which I didn't very much. They understood that I, I liked to work and I was good, good, good with people. And so they, um, they, they approached me and said, hey, well, there's an opportunity um, in East Oakland of a, of a territory becoming available. There's a gentleman there, he won't, he's gonna retire. And uh, we thought you'd be a perfect fit. And so I said, wow, I said, that's, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. So I said, what exactly does that take financially to get into that business? So we sat down and, and talked about that and they told me what the numbers were and all that. And, and um, I went ahead and worked on my end to, to, to get the money together. And uh, I, I had a family member who assisted with that. And, and, and so I was able to, to, to buy the first territory. Hmm. And, um, and so once I got my feet wet uh, with, with sales in the in Snap-on tool business, you know, business, I met another gentleman who really, really affected my approach is the best way. His name was Ted Whiting. He was at that time uh, just doing things no, no one had ever done in, in sales and with Snap-on. He, the average salesman might be doing about five or $6,000 a week. He was doubling that. No one even had seen this guy, what he's doing. So what, what did I, what did I do? I want to meet this guy, right? And I want to find out what he's doing. 
So he's at one of the sales meetings and I, I, I corner him and we start talking and, and uh, he's starting to tell me all these ideas. And I'm like, wow, I'm going to do that. So he became a mentor as well. And so, um, so after I was in that territory for about two and a half to three years, and once um, I, they saw that I, I, I did very well at it myself, they offered me a management position. Uh, that was in Sacramento. So it was about an hour and a half north of where I lived. And I, 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 my first knee-jerk reaction was to say no, because I was really enjoying what I was doing. Um, and, uh, but they, they approached me with, hey, there, there's some security with becoming a manager. You're going to be an employee of the company. You get, you get stock options. You get you know, retirement. You get all, all these things that you know, I didn't have as, a, as an independent dealer. So I ended up pulling the trigger, and I went ahead and, and became a manager in 1998. So. Yeah. Excellent. I know you've, you've mentioned Ted Whiting before. I use a association evaluator for talks. I, <clears throat> excuse me, did a couple of talks this week and I have this, who you associate with, it's time to take inventory. Who, who's somebody you should disassociate with, somebody you should limit your associations with, or somebody that you want to enhance your associations with. And then lastly, somebody you can mentor or they can mentor you. And yeah. every time I've ever had this subject, I think about, uh, I even remember the name, Ted Whiting, because that shows there's an example by finding the mentor. And I, I don't know if it was Tony Robbins or whoever it said, but somebody gets credit for saying that, go find somebody that's getting the results that you want to do and then do what they do. And, yeah. and yet it's so funny, uh, like I used to say, if you want to ride a bike, ask Lance Armstrong. And yet the people ask the guy, the next door neighbor, here's how to ride a bike. What do you know about riding a bike? You know, so it's, it's just kind of odd. But, but I, want to, I want to ease into a lot of years with Snap-on and you took the brief um, uh, detour over to Cuda and back. But I, I was thinking one of the things I'd be curious about is uh, memory serves. Josh is the one that's going to be coming on and at some point to uh, maybe at some point take over. But but using Josh as, as an example, I'm sure you've already had these conversations. But so Josh says, do you well, listen, Wald, I'm excited about this opportunity. Uh, what are the key three or four things it's going to take for me to be successful? What would you tell Josh? Well, number one, like we said earlier, um, do what you say you're going to do. Your, your, your word is the most important thing we have on this planet. I don't care if it's you, know, you saying, uh, hey, do you want to do a podcast? And me saying yes, and me flaking out on you, that means I'm a flake. Mm -hmm. Me continuing and agree to what time to do the podcast, one o'clock on, on Saturday. That, that's, that's, your word is, is the most important thing. And again, that sounds like a simple answer. But because I see these guys every week, week in and week out, uh, they're asking me to order tools or asking me to send in repairs or asking me for pricing on, on toolboxes. There's, there's a variety of things that, that go on. And so that's, that's number one, I would tell them, uh, anyway. Number two, if you're lazy, you're not going to make in this business. It just, it just does not work. Um, there's some, there's some businesses you can get by on being lazy. Uh, I, I would say city jobs, county jobs, you know, you are maybe work for Boeing, whatever you can maybe have a lazy streak in you and you, you go punch your clock and away you go. But nothing happens until I leave this door, my, my kitchen door here, go out to that truck and start it up. Nothing happens. So if, are there many a times I could just say, you know what, I don't, I don't feel like working today. I could. I'm self-employed. I don't have to answer to anybody. But on the contrary, I have to answer to 250 customers every week. Okay? And they're expecting me to be there every day, every week. And so, but if you, if you don't, have that commitment level, you're not going to make an example. Yeah. And then finally, uh, the third part of that, that answer is um, you've got to be, you got to be a nice person. And I'm not saying I'm a Mr. Nice guy out there, but I try to pe treat people the way I want to be treated. We all try to do. Um, I try to, when someone gets mad at me, which does happen and they get angry at me, I try to just let them vent and get it off their chest and then try to solve the problem because yeah. it's usually over a problem. Yeah. And if you don't have those three things going for you uh, in, 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 in the Snap-on business, then you're probably not going to make it. And I've seen guys, I, you've heard me use this, uh, this theory. It's called the stew theory, right? It's a big, big pot of stew, right? And you've got a Snap-on dealer who's just, he's the number one in the company. He's got every, every ball he's juggling. He's making a lot of money. And so let's just say one day he decides to, Instead of showing up at 80, he shows up at 8.30 to the shop, to a shop. And he just takes that one ingredient. Did that change the flavor of the stew? Yeah, maybe not. They might say, hey, Walt, where, what happened? You were supposed to be here at 8. Oh, I, I slept in. Oh, okay. 
Well, let's say, let's just say that the next week I, I decided to, to go in unshaven and I, 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 I did decide not to shower. I look kind of, kind of, kind of crappy. Well, that's a pretty good size ingredient. People are going to look at you. What's you okay? So another ingredient. So if you keep taking out ingredients in this business, guess what you're going to have the other day, a bowl of water. And it's not going to have any flavor at all. Yeah. And I've tried to, I try to throughout my career add ingredients mm -hmm. because you're always trying to make the stew taste better. And to be where it says you, you walk onto a, you have a customer walk onto your, your truck and they say, wow, my last dealer didn't have all this product and all these, these cool sales and all. That means you're putting the right ingredients into the stew. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And I remember when it's, I haven't thought about that for a while too. We haven't talked about that in a while, but you brought that up, up way back when, probably sometime shortly after we met or somewhere in the early years of these 26 years. But I always liked it because it's such a great analogy of the, who knows, I say I've known you for 26 years in an average stew, maybe there's 25 ingredients. I don't know. It's, it's some number like that, I suppose, in the meat and the seasoning and the tomatoes and whatever it might be, the chili beans or whatever. But it's just such a great analogy because people say, well, I just want to, what's the one trick to being a, a great salesman? Well, it doesn't, it's not that easy. It's like, oh, yeah. get the Boeing account. Oh, you have the Boeing account. So now you have to do anything because they're, they're the biggest account in the country or whatever. Yeah. But it, it's, it's such a great analogy. And I love analogies and I love stories to illustrate points because it, it's, well, I can't really tell you. All I know is if you take these 26 ingredients and put them all together, you get a great tasting stew. Yeah. And again, one or two, it, it's not going to really impact it as you just said. But I just know it's got to be the combination because I just sometimes feel like uh, it's just funny how people uh, approach things. And I, I try to never say names, but I look back on all my years on the planet, people that impacted my lives that were mentors or whatever the opposite of mentor is, is something you don't want to be. And there's one individual that uh, I worked with at Nordstrom, no matter what I did, he always said to me, let me show you an easier way. <laughs> there was always an e Sometimes there isn't an easier way. You know, you have to do it. No, that's, that's too much work. He yeah, right. needs to have an easier way and things. So, and, and you mentioned that there were several things and I'm going to kind of recap in a little bit, maybe five, 10 minutes, we'll wrap up with uh, some of the tips and takes away, takeaways, which I really like. Um, but if you're looking at the, you mentioned several things, but if you're looking at the unsuccessful, to look at this from the opposite direction, the unsuccessful snap-on dealer, as an example, what would be at the top of the list of where they're dropping the ball, would you say the most when they're not being very successful? That's a, that's a good question because there's, there's on the outside, you know, you, you see dealers that, that I call either fail or they, they've changed to change careers. And, um, and there's such a dynamic because, I know when you worked at Nordstrom, you didn't have to, you didn't have to balance uh, Blake Nordstrom's books, right? You, yeah. you weren't the accountant. Okay. Right. So you, you, you came on as a salesperson, whatever your starting role was. Well, in this business, it's a franchise. And so I've got to, I've got to learn how to budget myself properly enough to where I can pay my, pay myself, pay my bills, keep my inventory strong, be able to uh, extend credit, which I do that on a regular basis. And so you got to be able to juggle all those, all those things. And, and thank God, again, I had three people that, that taught me at a very young age, because again, when you're, when you're um, early twenties, you know, you're, you're just trying to make it, make it work, much less juggle everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I had some great, I had some great, I had some great guidance. And so, um, but the number one, the number one thing to answer your question, why, why guys fail in this business is they, they get it, they buy the franchise and they would say, wow, I'm making a lot of money. That's their perception because there is a good amount of money to be made. But the problem is the money you're making has got to go right back into the business until the business is paid for. Mm, true. If you don't do that. You're going to fail. Yeah. And so what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I, I've seen this happen. I don't have enough fingers and toes. Guys get in the business. They've got an old used, you know, 2005, you know, Pontiac, whatever. That's their only car. And then a year goes by, they got, a, they got rid of that. They got a brand new uh, BMW for the wife. They got a brand new truck for, for him. They've got and all this, they're, they're spending like crazy. Well, you haven't paid for your business yet because you yeah. still have loans against your business. Yeah. That is the number one, number one reason guys fail. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think about sometimes in my first foray into business in my mid-20s and 
probably was a little bit more like that buying that fancy truck and buying the car and everything. And then when I started that gratitude guy, I put in here, uh, reinvest earnings. You got to keep putting it back into the thing and, and keep Absolutely. building the product or building the service and what have you. So uh, we're just going to take another five or so minutes. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to tell the listeners about uh, what it's like to be a dad and a little bit about a certain son that you have. Yeah, again, we, uh, you and I share the same luck because we, you, I love your phrase, you call it the, uh, the birth lottery. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were lucky to, to have your son, Connor, be born for, for, for in your life and, and Dominic to be born in mine. He's 21 years old. Um, he's in college currently. He's on a baseball scholarship. And uh, he's, he's uh, again, just, just the, the number one priority in my life. Uh, he's, um, again, I, I hope he, he's, he's got a plan to get to the big leagues. We'll see if that happens. He's, uh, he's committed in that area. He's got he's, as much as commitment as I have with Snap, but he's got with baseball. Wow. Um, but most importantly, and this is what we all hope with, with our, our kids, is he's, he's a, a likable, like everyone, everyone loves Dominic. Um, he's, he's always reaches out to, to learn about the person he's meeting. He's got so many friends as does Connor because of that. He's that's not all about him, even though he's a very gifted athlete and he's a very good looking guy and all that stuff, but he cares about people. Right. And, um, and again, I'm not taking all the credit obviously because his mom did a great job raising him as well. So, um, but yeah, yeah. Dominic is, like I say, he's not, and now we're in a, the next phase of our, our relationship is, you know, I, like I told him when he turned 18 is. I said, Dominic, I said, um, you know, my job as far as raising you as, as a person is over. We now are going to go into another phase of our, our relationship. And that's, you need advice. I'm, I'm going to give it to you anytime I want. But as far as, you know, telling you how to be a, a human being and, and, and right from wrong, I've done all that. It's, you, you know. Yeah. And so it's, it's really cool now because he, um, he kind of talks to me a little bit like, like his buddies, you know, kind of cool. He'll throw out an occasional swear word, which he never did that when he was, you know, under 18. And, uh, and so it's, it's really kind of cool to, to see it evolve. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's. And even though I know you talk to him obviously all the time uh, at 21 year old Dominic watching this uh, podcast, what message would you have for Dominic today? Well, the message I would give him today is um, keep, keep the same focus that you have with baseball on life. Mm. If you can, if you can do that, you'll be successful for whatever you do. If, yeah. if, whatever, whether baseball works, whatever uh, happens after, because that's, that's, that's the trip to life is, uh, is staying focused and staying on the path. If you have a goal, keep going after it until you achieve it. If, a, if, if the goal doesn't work out, make another goal. And so that's, that's the message I would give my son. Yeah. And that, and that is a good message. And, and I was thinking too, the success he's had in baseball, he hasn't started out in the work world necessarily yet, but the success you had with snap on and CUDA and then going back to snap on and so forth, uh, very similar disciplines there, you know, work yes. hard, you know, all that kind of thing and, and, and make the best efforts you can and so forth. I tell a story about Connor first learning how to play baseball and he couldn't even hit the tee, tee off the, right. the ball off the tee and he hit the tee and says I got to hit you know <laughs> it's, like, it, it's you just got to keep trying and things so yeah. so I always take I'm always uh, very passionate about thinking about takeaways and tips for people as I mentioned in the open so some of the things that I put down just in general uh, Walt would pass on to people is, and I love the be on time. That's something that uh, you and I have talked about ad nauseum, but it's just so important. I just don't understand people that are on time. It's, it's so disrespectful. And people say, well, you don't understand there was a red light. I got the flat tire. That's fine. But it's just a sign of disrespect and, and you want to honor other people. And, and I think even you said something earlier about um, the guys at, at snap on in the warehouse. And the first word I thought of is the golden rule. They were treating you the way they want to be treated, even though you're the new boy or the new mm -hmm. new kid on the block, if you will. And they were the seasoned warehouse guys, but so important. But uh, actions have consequences. I think that's really, and it's funny because I hadn't thought about that in a while. I was spanked. All of us were spanked as a kid. That's not kosher anymore. I grew up in the fifties, but I'll tell you, you know, it's, I understand why it's not accepted anymore, but it sure got the point across to me. I <laughs> noticed that I, I better stop this behavior. Dad's going to spank yeah. you and I didn't like it. And so yeah. forth. But that's, again, that's maybe 50s, 60s type times, but yeah. actions have consequences. Uh, Gloria is use your ears twice as much as your mouth. And we do have two ears and one mouth and, and use them in that proportion. And, and I, I'm st still very critical of a lot of people that don't listen very much. And, yeah. and, and then this social media, you know, go, go, go thing. You, you text somebody, they can't, they, not only do they not listen, but they only read the text. You want to go on Tuesday or Wednesday and they text back. Yes. 
And you, go, <laughs> you didn't even see there's a question on the table. Right. Uh, a couple more. I mentioned the golden rule. Uh, Ted Whiting is a mentor, I think is really a cool thing. Um, your word, do what you say you're going to do. Somebody once told me that it just out of the blue, they said, you know, imagine what kind of world it would be we live in that people just did what they say they're going to do. Not even that you ask them to do that. They say, right. hey, yeah. Walt, I will call you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. OK, yeah, sure. Thanks. 10 o'clock comes and goes. A person never calls. And I don't get it. And your word, do what you have that you that's what you're going to say you do is because that's what you have. I totally agree. Don't be lazy. I, I, that's a, that's a challenging one for me. Cause I just don't know if you can teach not being lazy. It's like, I don't think you can teach work ethic, personality, sense of humor. There's a lot of things. I just, I don't think you take a work ethic class and get an A and all of a sudden you have a great work ethic and stuff, but I love that. Don't be uh, lazy, uh, make a commitment. And then lastly, I really like the stew example, which I hadn't thought of in a while because um, I haven't thought about it. Cause I remember you mentioned that was really a great analogy that you gave. So I, I might even incorporate it into one of my talks because I kind of like that, all the elements. In fact, we need to research and see how many elements go into a stew so I can talk about how many. <laughs> I'm going to say 26, but I don't know, but I'll, uh, I'll check and see. So, yeah. well, thank you, bud, for being on the podcast. Yeah. I, I wrap Thanks up. Thanks for having me. You bet. And I wrap up every podcast with the same question. And that is, uh, even though we've talked a lot about tips and takeaways from you, but but what's the, what's one thing, and you get to pick just one thing you know today that you'd like to know at 18 that would have helped you? Well, boy, that's a good question. Um, I would have to say that don't 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 have your expectations so high because mm. um, people are going to let you down. They're going to. Um, you know, there's going to be, I remember when I was 18 and you remember this as well. I thought I had 40 to 50 friends. I really did. And to this, to this day, I wish I learned that you really don't have 40 to 50 friends. Yeah. You really only have really maybe a handful. And you know, what we, how we do it. If we have five, we're talking about five people that you can count on through thick and thin. They're not only in today's world, they'll, you, you call them, they'll answer the phones. They see your name, right? Two, they'll help you move. Three, they'll, they'll, they'll give you good advice. They'll loan you money. All the, all the big things in life. And when you start talking about that, it really narrows the field because at 18, you just think you, you've got so many people you can tap into for, for things like that. And you, and you really don't. Right. So I would say, I, I wish I knew that at that age, because again, you end up relying on people that really aren't your friends. And That's a great point. I wrote it down. Don't have expectations so high. And another way to say it, I guess, would be manage your expectations. Uh, yeah. Somebody once told me that I heard words of that effect a number of years ago. And I said, gosh, you know, I, it, 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 I agree, but it's kind of a shame because I have a very high expectation for myself and you have very high expectation for yourself. And they said, yeah, but not everybody's like you and people are going to look at things differently. And that's, of course, true. But the point that they made that I really like is when you lower your expectations to, to zero or one, you don't get disappointed. And yeah, anything that happens exactly. is kind of a bonus. Yeah. And it's sad, but that's actually kind of a good point. You know, yeah. it just yeah. makes a big difference. And, yeah. and it's, it's just funny how the how we manage our expectations can really determine. I use the email thing. And somebody said, I mentioned that to you today. Uh, don't be disappointed. Maybe it's it's four answers out of 10. And they said, don't be disappointed in the six. Why don't you celebrate the four? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's a pretty good point. I got to remember that. So, yeah, well, yeah. well, thanks again. And let me close by give, telling everybody a little bit more about the podcast. As I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating. That's always appreciated if you like what you're hearing. And I know people that are struggling with all sorts of life issues. And I have a program that I offer to people called my gratitude coaching program. And it gives you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting or needing to make. Whether it's finances, your relationship, your career, your life's journey, or you just want to change something, this program will work excellent for you. And you also gain a complete understanding of your challenges. And then I ask powerful questions, provide guidance and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude to gratitude all combined to ensure your personal success. 
My four-month graduate gratitude coaching program is available to my podcast listeners, and they also receive an extra month free of charge. For more information about that, as I mentioned earlier, you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And lastly, a lot of people like to get my Monday morning minute video. It goes out every Monday morning at 60 seconds. If you'd like to get that, go to your text and you text in the number 22828. That's five digits in the number box, 22828. And then the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word. And that will send you a link. We'll get you hooked up and you'll get that for every Monday morning. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in, both viewers and listeners. And until next time, I'm David George Brooks, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.